Ooh. Oh, that light's very bright there. And if I can do something about that. Oh, if I just go like that. Okay, so I'm starting to get things organized here for our uh, rectory study group for this evening, where we are going to be looking at the always exciting topic of Christological heresies. Now, all things being equal, it should have gone on to our Facebook page with the notes uh, just down there. Um, and I see, oh, I see one or two people have logged on already. That's wonderful. And of course, the notes, as always, will be on the website. And when this is done, I will uh, download it on Facebook and put it on YouTube. So it can live on there forever. How exciting. Okay, so last week we looked at uh, Gnosticism as a heresy. Heresies are kind of wrong teachings in the church. Well, not in the church, I suppose, to be more specific. And I just realized I forgot to pull up my notes. So I can't remember the order that this was in. Okay, there we go. So if you've got the notes, uh, the first thing you'll notice there is I put up a cup of coffee. Um, not just because you're going to need to, a cup of coffee to stay awake for this. Although, you know, maybe. Um, but I love the picture. You can see like it's all this, all the little cups are balancing. Uh, and it's very carefully balanced as a person's pouring a, a cup of coffee. And in a lot of ways, a lot of the heresies are like that, the balancing act, where if you lean too heavenly on one side or onto the other, you end up falling over and you spill the coffee. Um, so it's always worth remembering almost all the heresies uh, are, are like that. They're essentially an attempt to, to keep things balanced. So the wrong teachings of the church are usually the right teachings pushed too far. And just next to it there, I have a, uh, a chart, a sort of a little chart there. And in the middle of the chart, it says the orthodox view of Jesus. Now, orthodox in this instance doesn't necessarily mean uh, Greek or Russian orthodox, although it includes them. It means correct faith view of Jesus. Orthos is correct. Dox is faith. So the correct faith of Je the correct view of Jesus. And then you can see all these little spidery arms coming off from from that. Uh, and those describe the six main heresies uh, are around the view people have of Jesus. And there's uh, Ebionism, Decetism, Arianism, Apollinarianism, Nestorianism, and Eutychianism. And uh, you probably don't need to remember any of that, to be honest. Uh, look, if you're doing theology studies at university or something, sure, remember them. But you can always Google this stuff. I've got mo the links mostly on the notes, and so it's worth uh, remembering. What I want to try and do this evening is take you through each of the heresies, uh, give you a little bit of a background. So they're normally named after one of the primary teachers uh, of um, this that, that particular heresy, that wrong teaching. I want to describe what it is they teach. And I want to talk very briefly about what's the question that's being answered. What, is, what does it give back? What does this teaching do that made it so palatable to people uh, or back then and still now? Um, so I hope that makes sense. So I'll give you kind of the technical name, uh, what it taught, and why it was, why it was valued, what the question was answering. That's the plan. Um, and the first one I've got there is Apollinarianism. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and obviously the, the, the main teacher was a guy called Apollinarius uh, of Laodicea. You don't need to remember that. And um, I don't know if you can see the picture there, but do you remember the movie... Uh, men in black and there's this bug creature that sort of lands and it takes over I think his name was Earl and he wears like an Earl suit and there's the bug inside the suit 
Well, the reason I've got that picture is, in one sense, that's what Apollinarianism teaches. That, obviously not that God is an alien bug from outer space wearing a Jesus suit, but kind of. In that, uh, Apollinarianism teaches that although Jesus had a normal human body, uh, he had a purely divine mind. Uh, and so it's, it's essentially that there was a divine mind in a human body. Um, and the reason it was so appealing to people um, a, at that stage is that what it did was it, it, it protected God, in a sense, um, from the sin uh, that is intrinsic to humanity. So if you would say, as Apollinaris did, that built into the very definition of a human being is a sinful nature, or a sinful mind was the language that he used, then you can't have Jesus being without sin and fully human. So in order to maintain the without sinness of Jesus, and there's a technical Latin term for that, uh, posse non precare, if I remember, non posse non precare, um, no, I was right the first time. Doesn't matter. Ignore the Latin. Um, the only way to, in a sense, protect Jesus, well, Christ, and I'm going to divert in a second, was to uh, remove the humanity from Jesus. Now, quick sort of side note. A lot of these play on the notion uh, that Jesus is the human form, in a sense, and Christ is the divine. So they'll say things like, Jesus was human and Christ was divine. Um, and that kind of thing. Now, technically, Christ, of course, is a title, uh, and it just means anointed. And if you've been baptized, in that sense, you are a, an anointed. But when you put it in capital letters, it means something a bit more than, than just uh, your run-of-the-mill uh, Christian anointing. So Apollinarianism is about protecting Christ from the innate human sinfulness of the mind or the human mind's inability not to sin. So the next one, the next one uh, is called deceitism. Now it, it sounds a bit like deceit um, and uh, so I'm just quickly going to make sure my, my phone's on silent. Um, it sounds a little bit like deceit, deceitism, and in a sense that's a good thing to think of. Uh, and it kind of comes from the Greek word for illusion. And what I've got there is I've got the, the picture of, uh, you know, the, the Rubens vase, where if you look at it in one sense, uh, um, if you look at them in one sense, it looks like two faces staring at each other, and in another way, it looks like a vase. And the reason I've picked that particular version on the notes uh, is that if you look at the image on the left, it's quite clearly a vase, isn't it? You can sort of see the lines and all the rest of it. But on the right, with the way the board is constructed, I think it looks very much like two faces looking at each other. And so you can see, so it's just, it's an illusion that's about perspective. Anyway. Um, the deceitists taught that the human, that Jesus was not human, uh, and in, even in some versions, that his appearance as a human was an illusion. Uh, it was an illusion constructed to help teach. Now, it was very popular amongst the Gnostics, in fact, uh, because what happened was that they saw um, the the material world as being inherently flawed uh, and perhaps even evil. And so what you got was you got this attempt once again to protect God. See how a lot of these are to protect God? Um, from the, the inherent flaws of the material realm. And so the appearance of Jesus, and in some metaphors, Jesus is, um, is almost just like a 
cloak bodily the body is a cloak that can be just put on and taken off at will okay so first one human body divine mind second one fake body entirely um, a hologram body is perhaps how we would say now of course they didn't have holograms back then so they couldn't think of that technological metaphor uh, moving on, moving on, we've got what's called Ebionism um, or Adoptionism. So now the Ebionites and the Adoptionists, uh, e Adoptionists is probably easier word to remember, um, were uh, quite different from the Decetists and, and the uh, Apollinarius. Because rather than teaching that Jesus was not fully human, that he was um, sort of divine brain or, or, or hologram human, they said, no, 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 fully human, and that the title Son of God was sort of an honorary title bestowed probably at his baptism, and he was adopted as the Son of God. Now, for, if you're an adoptionist, you would never for a moment consider that Jesus had been part of the nature of God from before time began. Rather, Jesus is, is a person, a, a spectacularly good person, a wonderful human being. So wonderful, in fact, that God uh, determines that Jesus can be adopted. And so, um, yeah. Now, this view, the, 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 the question this particular view responds to is the idea that the oneness of God must be protected. So the, many of the earliest Ebionites were in fact Jewish. And if you remember, uh, well, in church, in the Anglican church here, yeah, we said, you know, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So we, we, we kind of have that, the oneness of God. Now, if you're Jewish and, and, and you're not a Trinitarian, that oneness is... is then perhaps being eroded by a notion that in Jesus we have God. So once again, we're protecting God, but this time we're protecting the oneness of God. Um, so we're moving on. We're on the second page, if you do have the, the notes. Um, and we move on to what's called Arianism. Now, in many respects, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, um, which... Uh, sometimes called, referred to as the Mormons, uh, and Jehovah's Witnesses teach very similar ideas. Uh, and they're not, strictly speaking, Trinitarian. So remember, Trinitarian theology, we, we affirm that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. Um, now, Arianism comes from Arius, uh, and it's got nothing to do with the German Arians. That, that, that's just... Uh, a linguistic trick. Um, it just sounds the same. Homonyms, but definitely not the same meaning. Um, homophone, not homonym. Um, and what Arianism taught is a denial of the true divinity of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so it took various specific forms, you know, um, uh, and it was always sort of, yeah, so it took various forms. Um, but the core notion in Arianism is that when you're dealing with Jesus, what you're dealing with is in some way less than God. Uh, and, you know, the firstborn of all creation, uh, the most important creature in the universe. Creature in this sense is technical and doesn't just mean like a living thing like me or the dog, uh, but planets, solar systems, all creatures, those things that are created by God. It doesn't have to be living to be a creature, uh, but it has to be created to be a creature. Uh, and so they would say, yep, sure, Jesus, um, you know, the firstborn of all creation, the most important creature in all the universe, universes, however many universes you want, but not quite God. Um, and so... Uh, yeah. Now, Arianism is probably the highest picture of uh, the divine, 
of Jesus that isn't quite there. It takes very seriously the scriptural depiction of the separation between the Father and the Son. Uh, and once again, it, it kind of it, 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 it answers that question and it answers the question of the oneness of God. It is, however, non-Trinitarian. I feel like we're cracking through these. Um, so then the next one is uh, Nestorianism. And it's a Trinitarian one. Uh, but it's a very odd one. So and it, and it relies on sort of this understanding of, of the essence of a person. Um, so the, 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 the basic fundamental essence, the substance of a person. And it sees in Jesus that there are two persons, a, divine, a human person, probably would have used the word Jesus, and a divine person, the Christ, and they are both co-occupants, if you will, of the Jesus of history. It's kind of complicated there. Uh, and and it's, it gets its kind of its momentum uh, when Nestorius, who's a bishop and is quite, quite the heresy hunter himself, starts suggesting that the title for Mary should not be Theodokos, which means God-bearer, the one who bears God, but perhaps Christokos, which is the one who bears the Christ, uh, and is kind of separated out. Um, yeah, so Jesus is not the Christ, who is not God, but they happen to share a body. Um, and uh, so, so in that sense, it's still Trinitarian. And what it does is it protects God, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, from the taint of humanity. Um, can you see how many of these heresies are an attempt to protect God from humanity? So anyway, uh, Nestorianism uh, becomes declared a heresy. And, I, and I, I need to say this now, particularly with Nestorius, um, that when it was being taught, many, many, many Christians would have been uh, Nestorianists. Uh, it was Trinitarian, it had a high view of Jesus, it had a whole range of things. And it's important that we understand that in every moment in history, no one thinks they are the heretic. So Arius didn't think he was a heretic, Nestorius didn't think he was a heretic, um, none of the Ebionists. So Orthodoxy, the kind of the, the settled faith of the church, if you will, is always the ground that is contested for in whatever theological question that is being asked. Maybe I should have said that right at the start. Um, but particularly with Nestorianism, it's important to mention that because there were so many who were kind of in that camp that, uh, it, yeah, there would have been... A, it would have been quite easy, in a sense, for the early church to have adopted that. Um, which brings us to the final uh, heresy, and it's uh, called Eutychianism or Monophysitism. <laughs> Just, yeah, write that down. Uh, it's it's going to be a great Scrabble word someday. Um, and in one sense, it's a complete opposite of Nestorianism. So um, remember how I said it's, it's the balancing? Well, in Nestorianism, in order to protect the second person of the Trinity from the taint of humanity, the coin is pushed one way. And in this one, the same coin is pushed too far the other way. And so it collapses. Um, and, and we get... Um, so mono means one, and physit, the one spirit or one mindedness um, and uh, and I've and got a picture there of Pac-Man because <laughs> if you've ever played Pac-Man and you eat the little um, berries uh, and then you can eat the ghosts and they are fully consumed um, and so uh, in, in um, monophysitism uh, what happens is the human nature of Jesus is fully consumed by the divine nature of Christ. 
And so, uh, once again, the divinity of uh, the, se the second person of the Trinity is protected from the taint of humanity. Not by being separated from, but by being by fully consuming. And what you may notice, if you kind of take a moment to think about it, is that in one sense, this um, monophysitism or eutachianism is almost exactly the same problem as Apollinarianism. Now, in Apollinarianism, which was the first one we looked at, um, normal human body, divine mind. But in that particular instance, it's the divine mind of God. And here we have a just a slightly more sophisticated version of that, where it's the divine mind of the second person of the Trinity. So um, we can kind of, we, we're almost making full circle here. And all of these are what happens when you push one of the questions, uh, or one of the answers, in fact, too hard. So if you want to... Uh, protect God from the taint of what it means to be human. You separate out and then Jesus only appears human in one or two or three different forms. Or Jesus only sort of is, is fully human but isn't really God. See, we, we're still separating Jesus, uh, the humanity and the divinity. Uh, or if you, if you are... If you want to continue to protect, but you say that in the person there is the humanity and the divinity, uh, either you separate them out and it's kind of like, um, oh, I don't know. Um, the metaphor that comes to mind is um, what I think is called hot bunking in like submarines. And you'll have like you'll have timeshare on a hammock and one person gets out because their, their sleep shift is over and the next person basically goes in um, and in a way, that's uh, Nestorianism or Eutachianism, which is um, you've just turfed the person who you were sharing the bunk with. You've thrown them over the board of the boat or whatever, and you get the bunk all to yourself. Um, so, so you kind of can you I hope you can sort of get some other pictures there. Um, uh, I'll, I'll come back. Back to that comment in a second, Alex. So, so I suppose the question then is, why does it matter? Why does it matter? Uh, well, if we say that Jesus is not human in some way, if we take the line of uh, Apollinarianism or Decetism, what we say, in essence, is that God is faking God's humanity. God is just looking human. And most people, I suspect, would have a problem with the notion that God is lying about being about this. We also then have to ask the question about the reality of the death on the cross, which is, of course, such a central component of Christian faith. Um, so so we, 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 if, if we say that Jesus was not really human, on the other hand, if we if we if we go the other way and we say, oh, not really divine, but uh, very important, special, super special, uh, we run into a couple of problems. C.S. Lewis uh, is kind of referenced as being the source of the, you know, Jesus is either mad, bad, or God thing, um, but we we run into the problem that Jesus clearly does and expresses things that are divine in nature, that appear godly. Uh, and we also get no incarnation. Once again, very important in Christian theology, that, that God becomes flesh like you and I. If, on the other hand, we kind of go down the, no, the non-Trinitarian lines, and, and, and I say non-Trinitarian within the nature of God, because for a lot of people, that's, oh, yes, yes God appears Trinitarian. Um, you know, God is, uh, looks like the Father, looks like the Son, looks like the Holy Spirit. We run into the problem that uh, Jesus, uh, in Scripture, portrays a distinction within the person of God. 
So once again, either Jesus is lying when Jesus is praying, which I would not want to say, uh, or, 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 or that perhaps gospel writers kind of made that the whole lot up afterwards. Um, the other problem we run into is the distinct ex experience in the church of the God in three persons. So God in creation, uh, in, in as father, in, in as source of, of being, those sorts of things. God in the person. The disciples experienced God in Jesus Christ. And they, they recounted that, they recalled that. And you look, they may, it may have taken them some time to get there, but they experienced that. And they experienced that as distinct from God in creation. There was a, a distinct, different nature to that. And then in the, in the early church, there's the experience of the Holy Spirit, which is the experience of God in community, holding them together. And uh, that, that was also different from the, the, the material moment of walking alongside Jesus and the, the universal God as creator. Uh, and so each of these, what they were later declared as heresies, this is part of what they ran into and why it was so important for people to to kind of push back against those. OK, so one of the things is that there's a comment there. Uh, let's see if I can see all of it. Uh, just finding the whole concept of God needing protection, challenging and bemusing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> in, interestingly, it, it is one of those things. And uh, I suppose in a sense, that's my description of the experience afterwards trying to be honest uh, and, and um, present the, these people as being it, it was ra rather than protecting God from humanity it was a reverence for God and a view of humanity as being uh, fundamentally flawed uh, and so it wasn't about that God needed our protection, but that rather that the distance between us must have been so great that it 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 couldn't be overcome. Um, if we take on board Peter Rowland's uh, example, or oh, that sin is disconnect, and that to be human is to experience disconnection, and that on the cross God was subject to kenosis, there is the divine contradiction. Or I really, or I may be really tired and missed the whole point. Um, yeah, no. Look, uh, Peter Rollins is not the only person to make that comment, although he's one of my favourites. Um, and uh, Slavoj Žižek apparently makes a very similar point. Um, so, so that um, for for Rollins, uh, the very experience of disconnection. Um, and loss that it makes up sin is in fact experienced by God on the cross, uh, which is the only way it can be redeemed, um, which is not to say that the, the experience of disconnection disappears, but rather it is made powerless. Um, and so, yes, that would, that would almost be entirely the point behind uh, much of Roland's Lang language around um, uh, sin as the the experience of disconnect. Um, thanks for 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 bringing that up. Uh, oh, and Simon said uh, great, and he likes the men, the uh, uh, the black suits and men in black. Um, good, me too. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a great they great movies um, and a lot of fun. Uh, I think I think that's about it. Um, unless there are any other questions, I'll uh, say thanks for tuning in and watching. As always, I'll get around to putting it on YouTube. Um, and uh, good night and God bless. <laughs>